Thank you for that introduction. I'm very glad to be here today. With my talk entitled Product Specific Guidance Fundamentals from a Clinical Perspective, I hope to shed some light on the clinical aspects of product specific guidances as we continue to demonstrate how they light the development pathway for generic drugs. I begin with an outline of the topics I'll cover. First, I'll talk about study populations and some terminology that is commonly used. Next, I'll talk about bioequivalent studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints, followed by bioequivalent studies with comparative clinical endpoints. And finally, I'll finish up with some of the mandatory safety reporting and other clinical considerations that are safety related. So beginning with issues related to study populations and some commonly used terminology to describe them. We generally recommend healthy subjects, general population, unless otherwise recommended, which predominantly would be due to a safety issue with the study drug, in which case we would generally recommend the bioequivalent study be conducted in the patient population for whom the drug is intended. Subjects should generally be 18 years of age or older. And if the drug is intended for both sexes, we would expect that bioequivalent studies would include a similar proportion of males and females. Females included in the study should be non-lactating, non-pregnant, and dependent on the safety issues with the study drug, abstention or contraception should be practiced during the study, and sometimes for an extended period afterwards. Additionally, sometimes contraception is recommended for male participants, again, dependent upon the safety-related issues with the study drug. Okay, so drilling down on how we define some of the terminology that I just used on the previous slide. When we recommend healthy subjects, we mean adults greater than 18 years of age who are non-smoking and have no existing medical conditions and take no medications or supplements. By general population, we are referring to a broad collection of adults who may have chronic medical conditions that are treated with prescribed medications. However, the conditions are considered to be stable and the prescribed medications will not interfere with the study drug or the study's bioassay procedures. And of course, by patients, we are referring to the population for whom the study drug is indicated based on their diagnosed condition. Continuing on with terminology, non-lactating and non-pregnant should be fairly self-explanatory, but females should not be breastfeeding or expressing milk, and they should have negative pregnancy tests prior to enrollment and before administering each dose of study drug. Females not of reproductive potential would be either postmenopausal or posthysterectomy, where menopause is defined as 12 months of spontaneous amenorrhea without other medical explanation. And effective contraception for females would include those who have undergone permanent sterilization procedures such as tubal ligation, those who have an intrauterine device or progesterone implant, those using a combination of hormonal contraceptives such as the pill, patch, vaginal ring or injection, plus a barrier method, diaphragm, cervical cap, vaginal spermicide, or male or female condom, or those using a diaphragm, cervical cap, or vaginal spermicide, plus a male or female condom. And of course, based on the nature of the study drug, the use of hormone-containing contraceptives may need to be excluded. Okay, so moving on to the bioequivalent studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints. This is a typical page from a product-specific guidance recommending bioequivalent studies with pharmacokinetic endpoints, and I'd like to walk you through the critical clinical aspects of the study. First, you'll find the type of study, such as fasting or fed. Next is the design, and in this case, it is a single-dose, two-treatment, two-period crossover study. Other product-specific guidances may recommend multi-dose, steady-state studies. Next is the recommended doses strength to use, the study population, 
And lastly are the additional comments. I'll talk more about these recommended aspects of the study on subsequent slides. Regarding the type of study, generally we recommend two studies, fed and fasting. A fed study may be omitted for an immediate release product if the reference listed drug labeling states that the drug should be taken on an empty stomach. For example, one hour before or two hours after a meal. For modified release products, fed and fasting studies should be conducted regardless of the reference listed drug dosing instructions. And if serious adverse events are anticipated with either the fed or fasted state, the corresponding study may be omitted. Moving on to the study design. We generally recommend a two-period, two-sequence, two-treatment, single-dose crossover or replicate design. For study drugs with long half-lives, such as those longer than 24 hours, a single-dose parallel design may be chosen. We generally recommend that the study be conducted using the highest dosage strength available, unless safety considerations preclude its use. If an applicant does not intend to submit an abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA, in the highest strength of the reference product, then they should conduct the study using the highest dosage strength included in their ANDA. And as stated before, we generally recommend conducting the study in healthy subjects' general population unless otherwise specified in the guidance document. Regarding the additional comments section, these are drug-specific recommendations that are often related to key safety issues with the study drug that should be taken into consideration when designing the study protocol. These comments are frequently related to risks to cardiac electrophysiology, such as prolongation of the QT interval, pre-enrollment testing for any predisposition for organotoxicities, such as hepato or renal toxicity, and for monitoring subjects after dose administration. Additionally, there may be recommendations related to male or female contraception during and after the study. Now I'd like to move on to our product-specific guidances that recommend bioequivalent studies with comparative clinical endpoints. So this is a portion of a typical page from a product-specific guidance that recommends a comparative clinical endpoint study. And again, I'll walk you through the critical clinical aspects of the recommended study. Like before with the bioequivalent study with pharmacokinetic endpoints, we see the type of study, the study design, which in this case is a randomized double-blind parallel three-arm study with placebo control. Next is the recommended dosage strength to be used the recommended study population, which is usually going to be a patient population for whom the study drug is intended. And again, additional comments. I'll now focus on the additional comments section. In this section, you will find the recommended inclusion exclusion criteria, the recommended endpoints, examples of prohibited medications to be taken during the study, the recommended approach to the statistical analysis of the study and suggested headings for the electronic submission of the data sets. There are some differences for more recently published guidances related to recommendations for statistical analysis and electronic submissions. In these more recently published guidances, the general, recomm the general recommendations related to the approach for statistical analysis can be found in the guidance for adapalene benzoyl peroxide topical gel 0.3, 2.5%, and this guidance serves as an index guidance. Also in these newly published guidances, a link to the Study Data Standards Resource webpage can be found where there are required items and helpful tools for electronic submission of study data. Additionally, on the Study Data Standards Resource webpage, a technical guide for comparative clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies can be found. The guide provides 
recommended technical specifications and general considerations on how certain comparative clinical endpoint bioequivalent study data and skin adhesion and irritation sensitization study data for ANDAs should be submitted using FDA-supported data standards located in the FDA data standards catalog. Along with irritation sensitization studies and adhesion studies for transdermal and topical delivery systems, this guide should be used for comparative clinical endpoint studies using primary endpoints based on inflammatory and or non-inflammatory lesion counts, 100% clearance of actinic keratosis lesions, treatment success based on the physician's global assessment and the psoriasis area severity index, the total nasal symptom score, intraocular pressure for both eyes, and therapeutic cure. Also, within a product-specific guidance, there may be a reference to general guidances. General guidances contain overarching principles that are relevant to product-specific guidances related to a specific product class. Examples include the irritation sensitization guidance and the adhesion guidance for transdermal and topical delivery systems. Another example is the guidance for opioids with abuse deterrent formulation. Now I'd like to shift gears a bit and conclude with some issues related to mandatory safety reporting and some other clinical safety considerations. First, the mandatory safety reporting regulations can be found at 21 CFR 320.31 D3. I won't read these verbatim, but the first point relates to serious adverse event reporting and requires that these events be reported to FDA as soon as possible, but no later than 15 calendar days after becoming aware of its occurrence. Each report must identify its contents, such as a bioavailability bioequivalence safety report. Additionally, any fatal or life-threatening event from the study must be reported to FDA as soon as possible, but no later than seven days after becoming aware of its occurrence. And lastly, relevant follow-up information to a bioavailability bioequivalent safety report must be submitted as soon as the information is available and must be identified as such. Next, I'd like to show our web page where you can search for product-specific guidances. And I direct your attention to the language highlighted by the red box. This language is to remind sponsors and investigators that while designing and conducting studies to demonstrate bioequivalence of their products, FDA's product-specific guidances have recommended strategies to mitigate risks to subjects but in no way are these recommended strategies to be considered as comprehensive or exhaustive. Sponsors and investigators should also refer to current reference listed drug labeling, including any boxed warnings, as well as the contraindications, warnings and precautions, and adverse reactions sections, and take this information into consideration when designing and conducting their studies. Additionally, under 21 CFR 320.31, some bioequivalent studies are required to be conducted under a bioIND. These studies include any radioactively labeled or cytotoxic drug products, single dose or multi dose studies where either the maximum single or total daily dose exceeds that specified in labeling, or a multi dose study on an extended release product on which no single dose study has been completed. I'd like to finish up with this closing thought from our FDA website for clinical trials and human subject protection, which summarizes the intent of the clinical aspects of our product-specific guidances. It reads, adherence to the principles of good clinical practice, including human subject protection, is universally recognized as a critical requirement to the ethical conduct of research involving human subjects. Thank you for your attention.